Okay, Arfa. If you can uh, get us to the first slide, please. Sure, sounds good. Okay, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Genfish AGM. Um, this is a formal project number 184 of the Ontario Genomics Institute. Uh, there's a long title and we just refer to this as Genfish. Next slide, please. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that uh, our universities, partners and research benefit from and are situated on the traditional and unceded territories and lands of indigenous nations. We acknowledge the rights of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit people of Turtle Island. And we encourage all of you to reflect on where you are situated uh, and its history, recognizing that the participants of this event will be on different territories. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, this is GenFish. GenFish is a, an acronym that stands for the Genomic Network for Fish Identification, Stress and Health. Uh, I'm Joe Branchett, the Project Manager and Budget and Financial Administrator of GenFish. Uh, I'd like to welcome you. We're going to go through uh, uh, welcome and a bit of an overview, and then we'll be getting into some presentations. Next slide, please. Uh, we will begin by going through the event format and the agenda. Next slide, please. So the format itself will be very informal. Uh, unlike larger, much more formal AGMs, um, this one will not have any motions or votes. Uh, this is intended to be informative. Um, we realize that there's a diversity of individuals involved in this project, and it's um, quite possible that many of them are so focused on their individual portions that they don't really see the big picture. So this really, this event is intended to bring everybody together to really show you the big picture and the progress that we've made in year one, despite COVID. Next slide, please. Now, it's also going to be very short. Um, in non-COVID times, this could easily be a two or three day event with presentations and keynote speakers and uh, possibly over two days up to you know six or seven breakout rooms. Well, that doesn't translate very well in uh, Teams or Zoom environment. And too many of us are suffering from you know, what we refer to as COVID-19 Zoom fatigue. Um, this is how many of us would look if we tried to do this uh, as a two or three day event via Teams. So the decision was made very early to keep this very short and light and uh, just to get everybody informed and to start working on some networking. Next slide, please. So the agenda itself which as I mentioned, this is being recorded. This is the formal session. It's scheduled to go two hours. Uh, the, this is the introduction and overview section, which is going to be about 20 minutes. Uh, we've covered the welcome. I'm going through the agenda and format right now. Then I will turn it over to Dan Heath, who will talk about the introduction to GenFish. Arfa Khan, who is running the PowerPoint slides today. She's our research coordinator. She will be doing a little presentation on GenFish database and tissue archiving, and then I will give you just a very high level budget overview. It's only a single slide. Um, this isn't about finance today. This is about research. Next slide, please. As we go on with our agenda, after the introduction and overview, we will move into the project activity presentations, which will take about 65 minutes. We're going to go in reverse order and we will start with the GELS uh, decision guiding toolkit, which will be a 15 minute session. That will be made up of activity five. Christina Semenyuk from Windsor will be presenting that. And then we will open up the meeting to a short Q&A. At the end of the 15 minutes, we will move on to the fish health toolkit. That will be a 25 minute session. 
It's comprised of two activities. Activity three, uh, Ken Jeffries will present. He's from Manitoba, and Dan Heath, the project lead, will present activity four. And they are related. They're, they're both related to the toolkit. So then we will open the floor up to questions for three and four combined. And then we will finish off with the fish survey toolkit that deals with eDNA. And that will also be a 25 minute session. Activity one will be presented by Margaret Docker, also from U Manitoba, and activity two by Nicholas Mandrak from U Toronto Scarborough. Once again, it'll end with the Q&A session. Next slide, please. At that time, we will move to breakout rooms. And this, what this will do is because there's such a diverse thing, we have some social issues. We have uh, the, the chip, STP chip issues. We have eDNA issues. We're going to move to three concurrent breakout rooms. And I will post, I, some people were having issues with the links. So I will be posting the uh, link to the breakout rooms in the chat window. Uh, of this uh, meeting as we get closer to that session. So you'll be able to just follow it. Um, Matt Sharon tested it and it appears to work, so we'll be fine. The breakout rooms will also be recorded. Uh, OK, and then uh, when I when we're done, I'll jump into those rooms, call you all back here. We'll do a quick wrap up and that will be the end of the formal meeting. Next slide, please. We'll then have a short 20 minute break and then uh, we'll open up the informal session, which will just be a run through. We want to know more about the students who are on this project and and a little bit of, about their personal story and, and what their research is. So that's what the informal session will be all about. And then that will conclude our AGM. Next slide, please. Uh, afterwards, within the next couple of weeks, we'll be sending out a follow up email to all the invitees, regardless of whether you accepted or declined. And we will have all the links to the recordings that we're doing today, uh, other shared documents, the PowerPoint presentations, contact lists and everything else just to help better network uh, with your work uh, on the project. OK, next slide, please. And I'd like to now turn it over to Dan Heath to explain what Genfish is all about. Dan. Thanks very much, Joe. I'm probably going to turn off my uh, video while I'm doing this, but I thought you'd at least get an idea of what I look like if you've not uh, interacted with me in my role as uh, the project uh, um, PI for GenFish. OK, so uh, the point of what I'll be giving right now is a high level overview of what GenFish is and what it was created to do. Um, the more detailed description of what the various activities are and what they're intended to accomplish will happen at the individual activity uh, summary level. So what is GenFish? Well, next slide. There were three main GenFish goals. These goals were set up in consultation with some of the uh, uh, of our partners and many of the uh, research PIs and the idea is Ultimately, we wanted to improve the economic and cultural value of freshwater fisheries and aquaculture in Canada. The saltwater fisheries and saltwater aquaculture is, tends to be more of the focus of research and development in Canada, and we felt that the freshwater resource, fish resources were underutilized. Next slide. One of the things we recognized with uh, the millions of lakes and water bodies throughout Canada, most of them harboring some form of fish, freshwater fish resources, we needed to come up with a fish species inventory that was much more broad than is currently available in Canada. Next slide. We recognized that knowing what fish were in those various lakes and rivers was important but of course, the next step would be then to be able to determine what is the health status, particularly of the um, uh, uh, exploited fish species and the fish species that have a direct impact on the exploited fish species. So that incorporates the second goal of the GenFish uh, network, which was coming up with using genomic tools to assess fish health. Next slide. 
And finally, and in many ways more important, we recognize that genomics is often not a primary uh, comfort zone for many of the people whose mandate it is to uh, manage or conserve Canada's freshwater fisheries resources. So we worked with uh, social scientists and uh, people with broad interest in freshwater fish to come up with approaches where we could um, provide tools to allow the adoption of genomics uh, across many different sectors. Next slide. So what was our solution? Well, as I said, our ultimate goal was to improve freshwater fish resources management and, and conservation. Next slide. So we came up first of all, what are the primary challenges? And it, essentially it's monitoring and assessment. So what is there and are they healthy? Next slide. This came up with our first deliverable and you'll hear us talk about the fish survey toolkit throughout this. This constitutes activities one and two. And essentially we wanted to come up with a genomics toolkit that would allow uh, people with a very broad uh, background in science uh, and perhaps no background in genomics to assay or use these, this toolkit. Next slide, please. The second deliverable, also a genomics one, was to develop a fish health toolkit based on gene transcription. And again, the goal was not simply to provide something that was useful for a scientist in their lab, but something that would have applications from uh, environmental consulting to government uh, hatchery operations. Next slide. And the deliverable three actually ties in together both of the genomics deliverables and addresses one of the major primary challenges of actually getting this, these toolkits to be adopted. And that is the decision guiding toolkit that addresses the question of what are the barriers to adoption. Next slide. Okay, specifically, what were we trying to get in terms of our project outcomes? The first was the fish survey toolkit, and this is essentially we proposed to develop a three locus quantitative real time PCR assay for all Canadian freshwater fishes based on using environmental DNA extracted from water samples. Next slide. The fish health toolkit is based on transcriptional profiling and we proposed that we would develop a 100 gene transcription assay that would provide a broad overview of the fish's uh, genomic response or transcriptomic response to a variety of stressors that are known to be affecting freshwater fishes in Canada. And the idea was to print this, these uh, gene transcription assays on targeted open array gene chips. And you actually see an image of one there. Next slide. And the third outcome that we wanted to get to was the end user decision guiding toolkit. And this is a uh, various forms of interactive interfaces that could be used for end users, our partners. Oh wait, somebody muted me there, sorry about that. Um, so the uh, interactive interface for our end users and partners to actually determine whether or not the fish survey toolkit or the fish health toolkit would actually serve their needs. Next slide. Okay, so the team, and you'll get to know them better through the uh, question and answer period and the breakout group, consists of 25 principal principal investigators from 13 universities ranging from New Brunswick to British Columbia. The original training plan included 36 graduate students and seven postdoctoral post fellows. I would say at a conservative estimate, we're probably going to double that through other forms of funding for HQP uh, and driven primarily by interest of our partners and interest of, by students who want to work on this, uh, on this project. Next slide. Our partners are diverse. They include uh, government partners, both provincial and federal. Next slide. We also have included industry from techni uh, technology such as Thermal Fisher, 
to um, uh, environmental consulting to aquaculture companies. Next slide. We also included partners from non-governmental organizations. Many of these have uh, freshwater fish conservation as part of their mandate, and they were interested in being part of this, uh, this exciting project. Next slide. And finally, we involved four uh, Indigenous bands and nations in the development of this protocol. And again, for all four of these categories of partners, our uh, level of collaboration has grown uh, dramatically in an exciting way so that in fact, these core group of original partners that helped develop this project has grown considerably. Next slide. So GenFish was designed to be a game changer not to improve the sustainability of Canadian uh, fisheries resources, particularly, of course, aquaculture uh, and fisheries within the freshwater context. It also, we felt, would put Canada as a world leader in genomic and transcriptomic um, applications in management, culture, and conservation of freshwater fish. We recognize that this could serve as a model for similar um, endeavors in other countries dealing with perhaps uh, more or perhaps less diverse freshwater fish resources. But the main goal was, next slide, was to integrate eDNA technology that had been validated to the point where end users would be comfortable using it for their mandate. Next slide. To integrate that with the Fish Health Toolkit, which is the STP chip. Um, and then next slide. Include uh, important social, uh, economic, ethical, legal, uh, and environmental aspects of genomic applications to a, re a resource that is at a federal level. To come up with a last slide that benefits to Canada and to the freshwater fish of, of Canada. Thank you very much. Up to you, Arfa. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Arfa, and I'm running the slide deck right now. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some of the databases. So there are going to be five different databases that are going to be generated during this project. The first database is going to be for a fish DNA database for eDNA assay validation, and this is going to be for the fish survey toolkit. So this database is going to consist of genomic DNA from all of the 218 freshwater fishes of Canada. And for each of the species, we want to get specimen vouchers from all of the biogeographic regions. Uh, to make sure that we are accounting for any genomic variation among and between regions. The second database is going to be for fish tissues for transcriptional assay validation uh, for the fish health toolkit. So this database will consist of mRNA that's collected from uh, whole bodies, uh, gills, muscle, brain, liver, and a variety of different tissues. And this is going to be collected from 45 species from across Canada, and these species are of economic, ecological, and conservation concern. The third database is going to be for archiving DNA that's isolated from eDNA samples. Uh, database number four is going to be for assay primers and probes for eDNA validation. And the last database is going to be for primers and probes for transcriptomic profiling. So to ensure that everyone has access to all of the data as it becomes available, we're going to be using a lab collector software by Agile Bio. This is a highly customizable software that allows you to create an archive that can track the processing of any kind of sample, even a water or a tissue sample, to a location in a well in a plate. Uh, and along the way, you can include all of the data that's generated to all the way to testing the assay efficiencies. So any data from all of the five databases that is added is going to be reviewed for accuracy, completeness, and to ensure that all required fields are filled in correctly before they're added into 
to a spreadsheet, and then finally into the lab collector software. So this program is going to allow users to see at a glance what sample is available, the parameters that were recorded during a field collection on a specific day, sample quality assurance, quality control, who to contact if you want to get a subsample to test your assay, as well as all the go sequences. This software is going to be available for all of the different labs and permit anyone with access to add their samples to the archive, and this is going to help to streamline coordination on projects. So for example, over here, uh, this is a spreadsheet of fish tissue samples that we have, uh, and along with it, all of the associated metadata. So once that is checked for formatting, uh, we can use this to generate a 2D map such as this one. So this is showing some of the freshwater fish species that we have vouchers for. And this can also translate into a 3D map. So sharing resources and coming up with a standardized way of doing things is going to be vital for the success of a project, especially of this breadth. So as you can see, there are a lot of different uh, parts that are going to be incorporated over here. Uh, and this is going to be even more important when we have PI spread across all over the country. So despite delays in collecting fish tissues ourselves, we've been able to obtain fish tissues uh, and we're working on assembling some transcriptomes ourselves. Uh, we've been in contact with a few places that have generously offered to work with us. Uh, this includes the Royal Ontario Museum, the Canadian Museum of Nature, uh, our own GenFish network, as well as partners. So if you've worked with DNA or if you've seen Jurassic Park, though some of the details from Jurassic Park may not be 100% accurate, uh, you know that DNA can be stable for a very long time, especially if it's preserved correctly. Tissues for DNA can be stored at room temperature and if preserved in ethanol or buffers, uh, that can also pro prolong their lifespan. On the other hand, uh, RNA degrades at a faster rate and it must be stabilized immediately after collection using variable uh, storage techniques such as uh, being flash frozen, stored in RNA stabilization solutions or combination. So here's an opportunity for you to help. If you think that you have any fish DNA, fish tissues, or you may have an opportunity coming up, please let me or let me know via email or you can let me know in one of the chat groups so I can get in contact with you. You can just leave your name, um, maybe a little notation that, hey, my name is Joe Brangett, I have some fish tissues and I can get in touch with you and we can help with the logistical side of things. Thank you. Thank you, Arfa. Uh, we're very quickly now going to take a peek at the GenFish budget. We're uh, just a couple of minutes over our time allotment, so this can be quick. Next slide, please. The total project for this uh, huge endeavor is just under $9.1 million and is spread over four years. Next slide, please. Uh, we can look at it by major activities. Uh, you can see that the, the two largest segments are the development of the uh, fish health toolkit and the fish survey toolkit and they are in the neighborhood of over 4.2 and 3.5 million dollars respectively next slide please and if we look at how the budget is spent by categories with the exception of services from others as we know any type of, of genomic sequencing and analysis is an expensive undertaking um, when we look at uh, the next major budget line, it's salaries. It's the, it's the students and the HQPs. I do want to point out very clearly that not a single PI uh, draws any type of salary from this project. This, uh, the salaries budget is just for a uh, little bit of project administration and mainly well over 90% is going to the students and the HQP. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, I just want to mention to date, we've spent about 50% um, of our allotted budget thus far in year one uh, of the year one budget, just because we're, we're so restricted with COVID um, and most of that money has gone to wages. Okay, if we can now begin with our project activity presentations. Next slide, please. I would like to turn this over to Tina Semenyak, who will introduce activity five. Perfect, thank you. Um, hello everyone, bonjour, Annie and uh, Boussou. 
Uh, thank you very much. My name is Christina Semenyuk and I'm an associate private professor at the University of Windsor. And it is uh, my privilege to be able to coordinate this exceptional team of researchers that are involved in activity five. You're gonna hear the word GELS bandied about, but GELS actually stands for genomics and is ethical, environmental, economic, legal, and social aspects. This part of GenFish actually involves seven main PIs across five universities, along with their students. Next slide, please. So we also have a toolkit that we're gonna be delivering at the end of GenFish. And, and this is, as Daniel mentioned, our decide, decision guiding toolkit. And it's meant to be able to, to help our partners and our users to assess the benefits and the costs of adopting, adopting these toolkits. Importantly, the toolkit's gonna to be based on end user or our partner knowledge of genomics, the efficiency of genomic tools versus our conventional methods that we typically employ. What's really important is the cost effectiveness of our genomic tools, and this includes the infrastructure, human res resources, lab and field costs. But on top of that, our toolkit also must be socially and ethically acceptable. And again, of these scientific technologies. And at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that the toolkits, the health toolkit and the, um, the eDNA toolkit has scientific and, and policy defensibility in terms of we actually want to enact any of our findings into law. Next slide, please. So we have three main objectives within Activity 5, and the first one is led by Dr. Amy Fitzgerald from the University of Windsor, and she and her team are looking into the emerging ethical concerns with using genomics, both in, in fisheries and culture monitoring and health assessment. Her team is um, using a, a variety of methodologies to try to identify and assess the weight of ethical concerns that could potentially block acceptance of using genomics like our transcriptomics toolkit to improve the adaptability of fish for release in the wild. Amy and her team are also though, looking at emerging ethical concerns over the ownership and privacy of eDNA genetic information. And Amy's team uses, a, like I mentioned, a, a variety of methodologies from literature reviews to media sweeps to case studies, as well as focus groups. Next slide, please. The second um, activity that we have in here, our objective, is led by Dr. Tongji Li from the University of Guelph, where she and her team are assessing the social, economic, and regulatory factors impacting social acceptance and adoption of the genomic toolkits. And it's really important because it's not only partner adoption and regulatory compliance issues, but Tongji and her students are also going to be looking at the public general acceptance because industry is sometimes becomes increasingly reluctant to invest in new technologies that can face public opposition. And so Tongji and her team will be using a variety of behavioral and experimental economics to determine how different instruments influence the rate of new technology adoption, but not just adoption, but diffusion to help inform policy design. Next slide, please. Our last objective is led by Dr. John Lievernois from the University of Guelph, where he'll be exploring the ex ante evaluation of innovative technologies. That simply means that trying to identify which alternatives, so our toolkits versus conventional, potentially a mixture of the two, can yield the greatest benefit from an intended investment. John and his team are going to be accomplishing this by providing a data-driven comprehensive assessment tool to, to support the decision making. And the methodology that's gonna be involved with this objective is, is truly inter and multi-person disciplinary. Um, we're going to be synthesizing all of the findings towards the end of Jen Fish's tenure. We're working across both the social and the natural science team leads, as well as many of the committees. So we're gonna be working with a business advisory committee, end users committees that GenFish has set up, ethics and implementation committee of which John is actually our, our chair. All of us combined will be working together in a co-productive mode to be able to create a multi-criteria decision-making model. Mentioned before, this is part of our decision-making toolkit, again, to allow potential end users to evaluate the cost and benefit of adopting GenFish's genomic toolkits. And perhaps even more importantly, to try to develop a transition and a translation plan consisting of possible mitigation strategies for implementation. Next slide, please. So during COVID, we have still been incredibly successful and have been able to, uh, I think, really advance in, in what our objectives and our mandates are. And in general, Activity 5 has, has been putting together some, some really great thought pieces um, 
on co-production. So for example, uh, Dr. Stephen Cook, in relation to some other GenFish members, as well as researchers from two other Genome Canada projects collaborated to write a paper on co-production and how it relates to fisheries research and management in Canada. And it's currently out in the journal Fisheries. This paper describes actually what co-production is. It outlines its benefits relative to other approaches to research and the challenges and also provides practical guidance on how to embrace and enact knowledge co-production within fisheries research. Next slide, please. We've also been working um, across Activity 4 and Activity 5 researchers and partners on a paper that is meant to try to put transcriptomics into action for freshwater fish management and conservation. So this paper actually explores how to actualize the Fish Health Toolkit kit in practice. And with our partners, we, we drew on seven case studies to reveal the translational pathways that are needed, that are essential to be able to overcome barriers to technological adoption, and then accelerate um, the uptake of gen genetics-based applications in fisheries assessment, management, and conservation. So this paper is almost out, but this is one of the diagrams and the figures of our paper, um, just to help summarize everything in terms of what it means to use a gene chip. Next slide, please. And so we have had other notice, notable accomplishments. So for example, um, Dr. Fitzgerald, her team has been working on media reports and the paper is almost done that addresses eDNA ethics and she's also working on a media sweep to look at transcriptomic barrier issues um, in terms of uh, public acceptance. Amy is also working with a team of us, so Dr. Satna Sharma, as well as um, Steve Cook, on 100 questions for eDNA in aquatic monitoring and management. And a lot of us today on this call might actually be um, hit up to respond to what some of these questions may be because this is actually asking what issues, if addressed, can assist with greater development and implementation of eDNA tools for aquatic monitoring and management. So if you're interested in this or in any of Amy's other research, head on over to breakout room number three. Next slide, please. Tongji and her team have been busy developing a questionnaire along with Dr. Steve Cook and Dr. Vivian Nguyen. It's a, coming up with a questionnaire and randomized control trials, targeting recreational anglers and asking anglers what their preferences are for sites that they're angling at that could potentially be adopting eDNA technologies. There's their preference for or against it. Tongji is also involved in setting up and creating laboratory experiments using economic and policy instruments, investigating how our GenFish tools can actually be involved in influencing and nudging individuals' behaviors of adoption and even conflict mitigation. Again, if you're interested in anything um, that Tongji and her team are doing, as well as Vivian Nguyen, again, breakout room number three is for you. Next slide, please. And so objective number three with Dr. John Lee Renoir, again, it's gonna potentially really gear up and, and get underway towards the end, but what we're doing is we're listening closely to what we're hearing from all the other activity teams, the activity leads, and we're going to be starting to focus group plan for the assessment of the decision support tool for each GenFish toolkit. Again, if you're willing to be involved in any of those, the one-on-one -on -one or the focus groups for the decision-making toolkits, it's critically important that we have your input for all of this because we want to make sure that it's specifically geared towards you and your needs, whether or not you're from government, industry, indigenous communities, general public. Thank you very much, merci beaucoup, and miigwech. Any questions? Steve okay. Parks has his hand up. Oh, go right ahead. Oh. Steve, you have to unmute your mic. Alrighty then. Well, I do see Steve said it's really cool stuff, so thanks for that. Um, if any of you have any other questions, just hold on to them then and make sure to, to meet us all in um, breakout room number three where we can really get down and talk about the details. Thanks again. Thank you, Tina. Uh, and, and this is why we've Group these little clusters into these time allotments. So as you can see now, according to the schedule, we should be moving on to the Fish Health Toolkit. Uh, and that's why we are having the concurrent breakout rooms so that the proper Q&A sessions can take place over there. 
I would night. I would now like to um, focus on our next segment, the Fish Health Toolkit, which will be Activity Three by Ken Jeffries, and Activity Four by Dan Heath. And again, time permitting, it will. Um, we will open it up to a Q and A session. This is scheduled to be 25 minutes long. Next slide, please. Ken, if you can take away Activity Three, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Jeffries. I'm a, a assistant professor at the University of Manitoba, um, and I'll just be briefly uh, updating you all on where we're at with Activity 3, which is the development of the Fish Health Toolkit. And this is uh, a, a process that involves seven different labs at six different universities that are listed here. Uh, next slide, please. So the aim of, uh, of activity three is to develop what we're calling a universal suite of assays for looking at gene transcription. Um, this is going to be genes that are, are representative of characteristic responses to environmental stressors. And this is using a techn technology called uh, quantitative PCR. And if you've been following along with the COVID news, uh, you sometimes hear that they refer to qPCR as the gold standard for for testing for um, for uh, COVID, and this is just using the same technology, but for looking at gene expression patterns in fish. Uh, next, and so the objective of activity three then is to produce the stress response transcriptional profiling chip, or the STP chip. And it was, uh, and, and Daniel mentioned earlier about how it works on one of these actual physical open array chips. And then this is how we can start to quantify changes in gene expression. Uh, next slide. And so what, where we're at right now is uh, we've spent the last part of the year, or last year, uh, coming up with a list of 115 potential genes for the STP chips. And as you can see on the right hand side of this slide, uh, these genes are characteristic of various types of responses to different environmental stressors. And these can be contaminant stressors, low oxygen, uh, general stress or temperature stress, uh, disease responses, and um, just to give us an idea of what these fish are responding to in the wild or in, in certain experimental conditions. Uh, next. We've also come up with a list of 45 uh, target species that, that Arfa mentioned earlier. Uh, next. And then we've spent the better part of the, the COVID shutdown uh, looking up uh, gene sequences for these 45 target species uh, uh, in publicly available databases. So trying to find the actual gene sequence for the 115 different uh, genes that we want to develop these qPCR assays for. Uh, next. And then what we're able to do with the different gene sequences is we can start to, to overlay them and try to figure out where there are sequence similarities between the different species. And then within those conserved regions of these uh, sequences, we can start to design these um, these qPCR assays that work for across different uh, work across our different 45 species as well as others. And now that we've compiled some of these resources, we've started uh, testing and designing some of these qPCR assays with the goal of having early versions of the STP chip uh, later on in 2021. Uh, next. And that's all I have for, for uh, Activity 3, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Daniel again. Thanks, Ken. And one thing is uh, in Joe's introduction, he mentioned that Ken and I are related, but actually we're not. We just are both really good looking. Um, so it's easy to make that mistake. So what I'll be doing is giving you an overview of activity four, and this is the, essentially the validation and proof of concept of the fish health toolkit or the STP chip that's being developed by um, Ken's group. 
I don't have a list of the of the PIs who are working on this. Suffice it to say, there are 15 PIs that are working in activity four across 11 universities. Um, the uh, reason for this breadth of uh, expertise focused on activity four is that we have to make sure that the STP chip will provide reliable and robust outcomes independent of which test situation we're under, whether we're in British Columbia or Southern Ontario. Consequently, we have a broad range of uh, geographic support for activity four. Next slide, please. Okay, so the point of activity four is to complete the final stages of validation. On the right hand side, you see a figure that was in the original proposal. And we recognize that the STP chip requires validation before uh, any end user is going to invest in uh, the necessary uh, support and infrastructure to, to actually uh, apply these chips. So the first two steps of the validation are being done in activity three, and that's what Ken described. Um, activity four is uh, step three and four, so controlled field trials, uh, controlled trials, and then the field uh, proof of concept trials. Next slide. The idea in the uh, final stages is that we want to collaborate with partners to make our activities or our experiments in activity four a true proof of concept. If we come up with situations or field uh, samples that are not relevant to our partners and our end users, then that uh, step may be scientifically interesting, but it will not achieve the goal of activity four. Next slide, please. The first objective within activity four, and there are three of them, is a laboratory-based validation of the STP chip. Next slide. The second step is uh, to validate the STP chip under field conditions. So not in tanks where we know the, uh, the specific stressor and we're applying it under controlled conditions, but we're moving into field conditions and we're gonna look at either multiple spatial scales where we're looking for variation in known or suspected stressors um, and as well as uh, mesocosm experiments. So out of the lab into the field, but still in a controlled situation. Next slide. Objective 4.3 is the proof of concept. This is the real world application of STP chip. Many of you in the audience have probably uh, already been contacted by some of the PIs or HQP in this project because we want to reach out to our partners and end users, have you identify situations where you think the STP chip might be valuable uh, and then we'll go in and partner with you uh, with, uh, to make sure that what we're doing is completely transparent to your operations and we learn from you in terms of where might the uh, roadblocks be in applications of the STP chip. Next slide. Okay, so notable accomplishments for activity uh, 4.1. I'm not gonna go into the details, next slide. But essentially here is a breakdown showing where we are in zero to 100% for each of the steps that contribute to a successful outcome for objective 4.1. Ranging from recruitment of students and postdocs to the actual STP applications fall 2021 is when we're hoping to be able to do that. I'd like to point out that activity four was not supposed to actually start reaching its milestones until late in year two, early year three. So we're way ahead of schedule. Every green bar you see on there is something that we were not, not actually planning on having any uh, uh, meaningful um, accomplishments. However, we found that there's a lot of interest and a lot of willingness amongst our partners to move forward on this. So we've, uh, we're in the process of a couple of studies examining non-lethal biopsy effects to find out whether we could apply this chip to fish without having to kill them. We're working on whether we could use blood to actually assay transcriptional profiles. And we're starting to work on the candidate species uh, RNA-seq to develop uh, the missing links in uh, some of the uh, uh, requirements for activity three. Next slide. 
So objective 4.2, remember this is under field conditions, but under more controlled situations. So not the proof of concept, real world applications, but situations where we know what's going on and we have some control over what stressors the fish are actually experiencing. Next slide. Here's the same uh, type of graphic. And while we've recruited uh, some HQP to work on this, we've identified two mesocosms that might be very valuable in this, uh, in this particular objective. We've not initiated any trials. Curiously enough, we probably would have been able to initiate trials even in year one, except for COVID-19. And I'm fairly confident that we will be initiating trials uh, in uh, 2021. The STP chip applications for this are probably not going to be kicking in until fall 2022 when we have uh, more uh, extensive field validation of the chip that uh, Ken's going to deliver to us in the fall of 2021. Next slide. And finally, the proof of concept. So this is the real world applications where we're partnering closely uh, with our end users. Again, not, this wasn't supposed to even supposed to start to year three. Next slide. There's been a lot of enthusiasm and concrete partnerships with some of you where samples are being collected and are being archived ready to go as soon as the STP chip is up and running. So this is very exciting. Some of the uh, uh, partnerships that we've generated are outside of our original proposal. Our original proposal had eight proof of concept partnerships. Out of that, four of them are ongoing and two new and uh, unanticipated uh, partnerships uh, projects have, have initiated already. Next slide. And that's it. And uh, I think we have some time for questions. Joe? Yes, we do. Uh, we actually have until 2.30 and we can certainly stick to that because uh, Margaret Docker, who will be doing activity one in the next segment, teaches until 2.30. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, I think ARF is kind of trying to monitor this as well. Or you can type into chat as well. Yes, you can. Nobody, everybody did such a great job of explaining things that there are no questions. Hey, this is Steve Cook. Can I ask a question? Sure, we'll let you ask a question, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> hey, could I get Ken or, or Dan to maybe um, explain to some of the, the um, external users that are on, on the call? how at the end of the day the the fish um, health chip will be um, sort of operationalized so that it I, I guess i'm interested in in hearing more having them hear more about the simplicity because right now we can do these things it's just they have to be done at the scale of an individual fish or an individual assay or more of a a, a shotgun uh, approach just will we'll look at all the you know we'll run gene array and look at what's up and what's down so can just hear a little bit more about how practical this tool will be and how much of a game changer it'll be sure ken do you want to talk about what the chip the the functionalities of actually using the chip are and then i can comment on what the application in the field might be sure um I, I guess one of the big things is uh, just how many assays can be run at the same time. And the, the benefit of doing that is, you know, we can screen an individual fish for, uh, you know, a, a hundred plus genes, but then we can really start to get the sample sizes up high enough so we can start really assessing kind of more population level variation in the expression of these genes. So it becomes a lot more applicable for, for uh, environmental studies, for example, because you can actually get you know, sufficient sample sizes to start actually counteracting a lot of the variability that's just inherent in when sampling fish from the wild. Um, and then 
in that that it allows us to do a, a screen of a, of a sufficient number of genes to be able to figure out if they are responding to various types of environmental stressors. Um, but it reduces some of the, the complexity that would be associated from actually, you know, sequencing the, the, the RNA that's being produced by an individual fish. So we can generate the data a lot faster. So it's just a much, much more high throughput method of, of, of screening uh, these fish for various types of physiological responses. Um, Daniel, do you want to take over from here? Sure. So there's some questions uh, that have popped up in terms of the application. The use of the full chip that Ken just described would be if you're monitoring a population and you wanted to know if anything was going wrong. So if you are concerned that a population may be under stress and you run the entire chip, then as Ken says, depending upon which genes are up or down regulated, you'd not only be able to quantify their level of stress, but you'd be able to potentially identify what type of stress it is. In the situations that Steve brought up or Paul brought up, if you have specific concerns, methylmercury or, or uh, some other particular stress, temperature stress, then you could target in on the specific genes within the suite that Ken is developing, and we could develop either individual assays, which are very straightforward, or a chip that's designed for specific environmental contaminants, whether it be metals or, or you know, organics or combination of it. So the beauty of this is it truly is sort of plug and play. If you have an application and you think this would work, then we could design and build these uh, chips for your specific application. If on the other hand, you're interested in just monitoring, then what you'd go with perhaps fewer individuals with the full, uh, the full blown chip and then say, okay, it looks like it's thermal challenge or there's some kind of behavioral challenge that's driving this. And then you might get a, a more working trip that is focused on what you're interested in. The other thing to point out is that if you're in the field and you're actually thinking of applying this, we would you would have to kill the fish until we find out about the non-lethal bioassays we're working on. But at this point, we'd look at probably having to kill a subsample of your fish, take the samples, put them in the buffer, and leave them uh, in the buffer in the in your uh, minus 20 freezer. Those samples would be sent to a lab. Currently, it would be one of our labs, but some of the consulting companies are expressing real interest in doing this as a, a, a service or using it to um, do environmental impact assessment. So instead of picking the fish up and trying to look at it, determine its health, you could do this panel and it might be viewed as a more uh, holistic um, assessment of fish health. Okay, uh, Ken, are you, uh, Celine's asking, how many fish can you do per, ch per chip? Um, and so that's, a, that's a, a great question. And, and that is going to depend on how many of the actual uh, target genes are included on an individual chip. So each chip can run 3000 different uh, qPCR reactions. And so it's just a matter of, of figuring out how many genes of interest we can run on the same individual um, on the same individual uh, chip and that determines how many fish can be can be run at, at a single time and the way we have it mapped out now is we're aiming for about 24 on a on a chip and then we can run four of these chips at the same time so we end up we can run in theory 12,000 reactions at a time And if uh, to put this in actual numbers, in case you're interested in the cost, a single chip works out to somewhere around $500. And if you're doing all 115 genes, you're capable of doing 12 fish. So if you're doing it all, it's going to be expensive per fish. Um, however, it will provide you a lot of information. If you were to target, say, 20 genes associated with immune function, now you're looking at being able to do 50 fish per chip and the cost is now $10 per fish. 
So it, it was uh, the cost of these chips are also likely to go down uh, in our inter interactions with Thermo Fisher who print the chips is if there's one that's really popular. So Paul's idea of a, a contaminant response chip, if that becomes really popular and used widely for environmental assessment, Thermo Fisher would be happy to print this and provide it at a sort of a bulk reduct, reduced cost. Are there any other questions? We're still doing well for time. We still have five minutes. Steve is asking about uh, environmental RNA application. Um, this is a really, really good question. Uh, environmental RNA is like eDNA, except you're getting the RNA from the water the fish are in. The uh, environmental RNA assays have been proofed, and there are a few publications out there where you can detect RNA that's coming from the fish, so the gene product that is being exuded from the fish in the water, and you're able to detect it. Environmental RNA tends to be very unstable, so you only get what the fish is, is uh, expressing within a few minutes. Um, so it is technically very challenging in the field. Uh, it was originally part of GenFish's proposal, but it was not in the final application. But a lot of people are interested in it, and I think that it's likely that uh, a number of researchers and a number of end users are going to follow up on not having to even touch the fish to take a non-lethal biops biopsy, but rather just sample water around the fish to determine what genes it's expressing. Ken, do you have anything further on that? Um, no, I, I, I think you, you you nailed it there. Uh, I I think it's a it's a really interesting uh, application of, of this type of work. I I would need to. Uh, my 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 concern always with that is, is just the fact that the RNA is so unstable, and so I always kind of making sure that you know a, an intact piece fragment of RNA is still uh, in the water sample and is still available for the particular primers that we have. That it, it's a bit more high risk than you know some of the more proven methods for eDNA. Um, so we have a couple of people with their hands up. How are we doing for time, Joe? Uh, we're good, Dan. We got three minutes. OK, um, John, I think your hand was, was up first. Uh, yeah, thanks, Daniel. <clears throat> I'm just uh, curious, uh, very, really, really interesting to listen to this. I'm just wondering to what extent, I mean, you're, you're measuring the health of fish, but at the same time, it seems to me you're providing indicators of the health of the water body in which the fish live. So I'm just thinking, who are the most likely end users of this technology? Is it people trying to measure fish health and or people trying to measure in, uh, environmental health, the health of the lake? Or both? That That's a great question, John. The GenFish original intent was people interested in the fish because this was a, a call from Genome Canada to develop genomic tools to assist in the economic development of freshwater fish resources in Canada. However, <laughs> there have been a number of people who contacted us from environmental consulting groups interested in using fish as kind of a canary in the coal mine where they would actually use the chip on the fish to see if there's any negative environmental impacts of some developmental, uh, some development project in the area. So it is actually the intent was fish health, but the spin-off is is environmental monitoring. And Scott, do you have a question? Um, I I just had a, a quick comment about environmental RNA. Um, to me, uh, so I, I believe that, you know, it could be technically possible to measure that. However, to me, the biological interpretation of that is like a whole nother thing. Um, that to me is a bit, um, I don't know, scary and untested. 
um, just because degradation rates, you know, and uh, degradation rates in the water versus in the cell, it just gets, to me, it gets pretty far removed from the fish. That's all. Daniel, Vince uh, Alice asked a question in the chat about how far along we are from being able to uh, validate this approach in, in the field. That's a, uh, a good question, Vince. Uh, we're a fair ways away. We're still in the process of uh, developing the chip and we have to make sure that the chip itself works in a reliable way. Bear in mind that we may choose a gene that we think has a particularly critical role in, let's say, response to organic contaminants such as PAHs, uh, and then we test it with our partners uh, in the lab and find out it is not responsive. Then we have to reformulate. The intent is to uh, move quickly on that. And in activity four, which is what I described, we have tissue samples sitting in RNA later in the freezer ready to test specific uh, uh, stressors, but in a field context to see whether it's working. But first we, we have to get through activity three. Okay, I'm just gonna jump in here. Uh, it is 2.30. Uh, I just wanna ask real quickly, cause it, the list is so long. Is Margaret uh, here? Yes, I am. Excellent, okay, we can, Arfa, if you wouldn't mind bumping us along to the next slide. Um, for those of you, Scott, I don't know if you had put your hand back down or if your hand was up from before. Uh, so any questions, thank you, Dan and Ken, for your presentations, and thank you everybody for your questions. Again, um, I have posted the link to the breakout room number two, and at the conclusion of the eDNA segment, we will then open up the breakout rooms and you can just click on these links to migrate over there and then continue your Q&A sessions. Um, as I mentioned, this is the fish survey toolkit dealing with eDNA. Again, 25 minutes approximately. We're gonna have Margaret Docker presenting activity one, Nick Mandrak presenting activity two, followed by a Q&A session. This should run until 2.55. Next slide, please. Margaret, if you can take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the, the goal of activity one is to develop, as, as Joe said, the eDNA FISH uh, survey toolkit that we hope is going to be of such benefit to uh, end users all across uh, Canada. And so as you can see, the activity one team consists of uh, six PIs and their trainees from six universities from across Canada, you know, from UNB in the east to UNBC in the, in the west. Uh, next slide, please. So activity one has uh, three main deliverables. Uh, each is associated with uh, three objectives that I'll be describing in a, in a minute. So the first of the, the deliverables is the development and lab validation of eDNA um, assays and protocols for all freshwater fishes of Canada. And it will include a web-based interface so that end users can um, access the performance and protocol details for each of the assays and also request um, primer and probe samples so that they can uh, test the assays to see if they're appropriate for their, for their uses. Uh, next. And then the, the second deliverable is uh, a standardized and validated environmental microsatellite DNA toolkit to quantify fish abundance. Um, and it will also have a, an interactive uh, website for, for end users. And then the, the third uh, deliverable is a validated uh, stomach content uh, eDNA protocol for the assessment of predator prey uh, interactions in, in complex fish communities. Next. So the, the, the first objective, and this is uh, in a lot of ways sort of the, the, the core of, of uh, activity one, is the, the development and really rigorous uh, lab validation of robust eDNA assays and protocols for all freshwater fishes of Canada. And this is being led by uh, Bob Hanner at the University of Guelph. So as 
you know, all or most of us all, you already know, I mean, the eDNA assays do already exist for several of the, the fish species in Canada, but first of all, many of them are region specific. So some likely uh, cross amplify with other species when used um, outside of the, the region in which they were developed. So for example, where you've got a different background of, of non-target species, um, the, the assays uh, may not perform as, uh, as desired or, or promised from uh, when they were first developed. Um, and then the other problem with many of the existing assays is that they might also fail to detect uh, different uh, geographic variants of the target species as soon as you move into a, into a different region. And then, of course, uh, another problem is that um, assays um, aren't available for, for many other species. So what we're, we're trying to do is to really uh, systematically approach this, uh, screen existing assays, and then develop and, and rigorously test um, assays for, for all of the, the, the 200 plus uh, freshwater fish species, um, plus the invasive species of concern. The goal is to have uh, three eDNA assays, so we have a certain amount of uh, redundancy for uh, increased uh, uh, trust in, in the assays, um, two based on mitochondrial genes, one based on a, on a nuclear gene, and uh, ensure that they reliably amplify uh, eDNA in a species-specific manner throughout the, the Canadian range of, of these species. So we've uh, as I said, you know, we're really trying to, to do this in a systematic manner. We have uh, all of the, the species uh, sort of uh, assembled into our, our database and we've divided the, the ranges into the six major drainages throughout Canada. And, uh, you know, the ideal is that we would have a single species specific assay that would work across the, 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 the Canadian range or at the very least um, have region specific ones that are uh, well validated uh, for that region and we're very clear where they are and where they're not species specific. Um, next please. So in terms of uh, progress uh, to date and our notable accomplishments to date, um, uh, taking advantage of the, the time that we uh, weren't allowed to be in the lab in the field in the, in the spring and, and early summer due to COVID related restrictions, um, we've made good progress on a number of fronts. Uh, first of all, um, in the in silico or computer based uh, testing of uh, existing species specific eDNA assays. So uh, this was, uh, tackled by, by, the, by the Hanner lab. And so uh, focusing on the CO1 uh, gene, the, the so-called DNA barcoding gene, uh, considerable DNA sequence data already exists for, for CO1, um, but more work was needed to really systematically test the potential of these existing assays for um, species specificity, particularly in the, the Canadian uh, range. And so the, the Hanner lab constructed a comprehensive alignment of CO1 sequences from uh, over 250 native and invasive uh, freshwater fish species, um, compiled and aligned almost 4,000 unique uh, CO1 haplotypes that they were able to get from uh, the um, Barcode of Life uh, database, and then tested the mm -hmm. tested 79 um, putative species specific assays against this alignment to see whether or not uh, with that uh, large comprehensive uh, database, they really are uh, species specific. And uh, quite surprisingly, only 9% of the 79 assays showed true in silico specificity, um, despite all of them being reported as species specific. And so I think a lot of this does have to do with um, a lot of the existing assays being uh, regional and not um, not being uh, developed for or validated for uh, a larger uh, a larger range. Um, next, please. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, I'll just uh, add. And then uh, again, taking advantage of uh, working from home, uh, the Hanner Lab also performed a, a literature review to to grade the existing assays on the the validation scale uh, developed by uh, DNA Aquanet. Um, there's a, a validation. Uh, is on a scale of one to five where one is incomplete and five is is fully operational and this um, enables us to to systematically identify which assays 
require um, additional validation on our part. And uh, and then again, uh, Hanner Lab took a, a good advantage of the, the restricted field season by uh, developing um, an app known as uh, MD Mapper 2.0 uh, that analyzes and visualizes on an interactive map and shares uh, qPCR assay results. So this will be really uh, valuable as we um, move forward to activity two. Uh, next, please. Oh, sorry, uh, two manuscripts almost complete. Yeah, and so then, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Thanks. And then where we're really focusing our, our efforts now, uh, particularly as we're uh, moving uh, slowly back into the lab, is on the lab-based um, assay development and, and validation, um, as mentioned with uh, two mitochondrial genes, CO1 and cytochrome B, and one targeting a, a nuclear gene, um, ITS1. And so what we're doing here is we're trying to take a, a regional approach with um, Mark Shrimpton's group focusing on freshwater fishes of BC, um, my group focusing on the, the, the prairie fishes, uh, Daniel Heath's group at, at Windsor is focusing on uh, the, the fishes of uh, the, the, the Great Lakes and uh, Ontario more broadly, Bob Hanner's group focusing on developing and validating assays for um, alien invasive uh, fishes of concern, and uh, Scott Pavey's group is focusing on the, the, the fishes of the, the East Coast. So we're really trying to, to work as, a, as an extended uh, lab group with our, our regional um, expertise, but trying to coordinate our efforts as much as possible to have consistent standardized uh, protocols and uh, to reduce sort of unnecessary uh, redundancies as well. Um, and there'll definitely be uh, coordination for those species that are found in one or more uh, regions throughout Canada. And as uh, ARFA indicated, we're developing a, a reference tissue collection so that we have uh, tissue derived DNA from, from voucher specimens um, from each species. Um, ideally from each um, major drainage drainage basin in which the, the, the species occur so that we can really um, test that uh, broad applicability of the, of the assays. And so for this um, objective, we're really focusing on the in vitro, the, the in lab validation, but we're also do, doing some preliminary um, in situ uh, validation. Um, so for example, where we have water collections where the, the species composition is, is well known, we can use that as a way of testing that the species specificity of the assay against a background of, of non-target species. And to date, uh, CO1 assays from at least uh, 60 of uh, the freshwater fish species on our list and 20 invasive species are um, in different stages of development and, and testing. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, objective uh, 1.2, this is the um, environmental microsatellite DNA or EM uh, DNA. Um, uh, part of the, the project and this part is being uh, led by Brian Neff at the University of Western Ontario. So with the environmental microsatellite DNA, rather than just relying on eDNA signal strength to estimate relative abundance of the, the fish species of interest, um, environmental microsatellite DNA um, allows for uh, allele counting that um, can provide information on the number of contributors to, a, to an environmental DNA sample. And so um, this is uh, quite labor intensive. It's not going to be done on all the, the, the freshwater fishes of Canada, but on a, a targeted number of, of species of interest and uh, protocols have already been developed for the amplification of um, Atlantic salmon microsatellite uh, alleles from, from water samples. And a manuscript uh, based on this work is already, is almost complete. Um, final slide, please. And then the, the third part of um, um, objective one is the stomach content uh, DNA, SC DNA, to help um, analyze uh, um, stomach content analysis when uh, morphological ID of, uh, of uh, stomach contents is, is uh, insufficient. And so uh, Daniel Heath at Windsor is, is leading this. And so um, 
uh, stomach content metabarcoding primers that have worked well for uh, Great Lakes fishes um, in, in a previous project in, in Daniel's lab is now being tested to see how well it works on, on other species. Thank you. Nick, you're up. Nick, are you on the call? Nick was there earlier. He might be having technical issues. Let's hold on a sec. OK, sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry. Uh, my my mouse died on me all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go to a plan B. Um, hi, I'm Nick Mandrak. I'm the activity lead for um, activity two. I'm a professor at University of Toronto Scarborough. And this activity is about uh, ground truthing of the uh, eDNA toolkit. That is, um, I, th I think it's more than just proof of concept. It is, can we can we actually standardize the use of eDNA as, as a tool in our uh, fish sampling toolkit? Next slide, please. Uh, so we have two deliver deliverables. Uh, one is to provide field-based validation of our environmental DNA toolkit and fish community composition data for key water bodies within the area of operation for our um, partners, collaborators, and uh, end users in general. Uh, and the second uh, uh, deliverable is actually a series of deliverables, which are case studies that will help with end user fishery management and intervention actions to improve the sustainability of their resource. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, the for uh, objective 2.1, our co-leads are um, are Pedro Perez Neto and Sapna Sharma, and it is a broad scale spatial temporal eDNA assessment of fish communities in 500 water bodies. So the idea here is that over the course of GenFish, uh, we will be um, uh, sampling uh, over 500 water bodies across a, a wide geographic and environmental range. And where possible, we'll be uh, sampling eDNA e and, and by conventional methods side by side. And as we're collecting the, um, the data, uh, we also be collecting environmental data uh, so that we'll be able to conduct uh, analyses to identify co uh, correlates and inhibitors of the eDNA results. In objective 2.2, uh, uh, we're carrying out uh, uh, several end user case studies um, uh, as identified by our partners uh, and uh, uh, that are an application of environmental DNA tools for a population level assessment. Next slide, please. Well, as you can imagine, uh, COVID really threw a wrench into the works in trying to sample, start sampling 500 water bodies. Uh, but despite this, uh, we were able to make some progress on this objective. Uh, next, please. Uh, we did uh, develop standardized sampling protocols and field sheets. Next. Uh, we purchased three Osmo eDNA sampling backpacks and um, uh, are currently in use, perhaps not right now in the middle of winter, but uh, were used this past summer by GenFish field crews. Next. And uh, we had uh, in a total of six uh, PI-led crews uh, working in uh, British Columbia, Ontario, Manitoba, and New Brunswick. 
Next. And we also had partner sampling occurring in the Northwest Territories in Quebec. Next. Uh, in total, we sampled over 300 sites and over 100 water bodies in the 2020 field season. Next. And uh, again, despite um, uh, COVID, uh, we were able to initiate six of the nine case studies identified in our application. And uh, I, we know that there are several other new case studies um, underway with our collaborators as well. Next. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nick. And thank you, Margaret. Now we open it up for about five minutes for a Q&A session before we move to the breakout rooms. Joe, I see Dan has a question. Go ahead, Dan. Um, so, Margaret, this is for you and Bob. Uh, when the alignment of all the different freshwater fish species available for CO1 was made, did it jump out that it's going to be um, problematic to come up with species specific um, qPCRs for CO1? Bob, do you want to answer that? <clears throat> Sure. Um, in short answer, yes, it does. Um, sadly, uh, it's the the CO1 barcode gene or the 650 base pairs of the five prime CO1 gene um, are typically informative at the species level, but building species specific primer and probe sets for all of the fishes across their range using just that marker is not going to be possible. It'll get us most of the way there, but definitely not all the way. Yeah, and I think that's and that's an important point, and that's one of one of the reasons for the the three assays per species that one alone will not always cut it, and in, in, in some cases it, it might for for species for which there's no other close relatives, but in in other cases, yeah, that that one might uh, distinguish groups of species and then you need a, a second one to to further uh, divide. There's also a sense starting to emerge from the literature that to have confidence in our detections, having multiple markers is certainly going to increase that confidence. And so if we have a chip and there's room to put more than one marker on, um, I think that's actually really valuable. Yeah, and now I think, yeah, I'm not sure from initial initials, is it John? I'm not sure if you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm John, I have, a, I have a question. So, Margaret, this is a question coming from an economist, so if it doesn't make any sense, just please say so, but um, is there a target, so Bob was just talking about confidence levels, is there a target level of error? I'm, think, I'm thinking of type one, type two errors, in in the in the assay uh, in the assays in the literature or in your field, is there sort of a, a target level or or a level once you've reached it, you say okay, these assays can now work in the field, even though there's going to be some degree of error. Yeah, and I don't and I I, I think part of there's always going to be at some some degree of error, and so I think one of the biggest things that we have to to do is be fully transparent in terms of what the how how widely it's been tested what the possible limitations are and so even i mean some of the assays that are already available i say that they're they may not meet our needs because they're they're region specific but even then if you say okay because some of the ones that we've developed for example for lake sturgeon in manitoba we know it works for lake sturgeon in manitoba 
but it might not be fully species specific if you move to where other sturgeon species are also found. So at least if we can be fully transparent about, about what species it's been tested against um, or with the case of the alignment, not just saying, well, we aligned it to available sequences and we, it was good showing exactly, you know, which ones it did and didn't. And, and so then at least, you know, it's a bit of a sort of a buyer beware situation. And so then at least if you start to use it outside of those parameters, you know that there might be challenges. Our goal is to do all of that testing and validation for throughout the, the species ranges in, in Canada. So it's not that each time somebody wants to use it, they have to learn what the, the pros and cons are. And then, and, and, and then once it's been fully validated that way, then at least you know what the potential drawbacks are. And then in terms of, you know, false positives versus false negatives, getting a sense of what the cost is of one versus the other, so that if, if you absolutely want to make sure that you can detect a invasive species when it first arrives, then you, then you would rather um, have false positives than false negatives as long as you double checked what those positives were to make sure you weren't um, acting too hastily. Um, and so I think, and I guess I'm sort of talking in circles a little bit, but I think we have to make sure that the science is as sound as possible, it's as fully validated as possible, that, but we also have to always be working with the, the end users and managers to make sure that any uncertainty can be interpreted in, in the way that it meets their needs, whether like when, if the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action or, or vice versa, making sure that 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 the uh, that the caveats are, are very clear so that those decisions can be made. Thank you, Margaret. I'm going to jump in here. Um, it is now time to move to the breakout rooms. They are open and the recording has started. If I can ask for all of the presenters to make your way, just to locate the link in the chat session for your respective room. Uh, you don't have to leave this meeting. It'll just open up a new window with a second room and you will be on hold in this meeting um, because you, as you know, we agree, you guys will be moderating uh, the questions in those rooms. So please feel free to make your way to the room now. And then at 3.30, I will come and collect you guys and ask you to come back here. Thank you very much. Oops. Sorry, Joe, one sec. My oh. computer's being a bit funny. <laughs> Just as you said, technology was cooperating. <laughs> Um, if you like, I can read the next slide. Can you just arrow down? Can you... It's completely frozen. It's frozen. OK. All right. Well, essentially, the wrap up is very simple. So I'm just uh, essentially within the, the next week or so, we will be sending out a, an email blast to everyone who's been invited. Again, whether you've uh, RSVP'd or not. And um, just to give you the video links, and then any other shared documents. Uh, and probably, I think I will work with the team to see if we can maybe put a little feedback document together to get some of your feedback on how today went. <clears throat> so at this point now, um, I did post a link in the, uh, in the chat section on how you can get to the informal session. Although most of you, it looked like the links in your PDF document were working okay. So that's a good sign. Um, we will take a, about a, well, it looks like about a 12 minute break now, 3.50. Why don't we come back for four o'clock? We'll just give people an extra 10 minutes and we will start the informal session at four o'clock. Uh, that'll give everybody a little bit of a break and we will reconvene in the informal session. We won't come back to this room. Okay, thank you everybody. This concludes the formal session of the AGM. Thank you for your participation and I jumped into the breakout rooms and they were all fantastic. 
So I think this was a, a real hit. Thank you, everyone. And if you can't join us over there, uh, we hope to see you more throughout the project. Thanks, everybody.